think the instrumentalization of human rights uh, has been a huge risk uh, to human rights. We saw George Bush um, talking, and in, uh, in fact, after one of his State of the Union address, an English newspaper did an editorial saying that he sounded like the armed wing of Amnesty International. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, yes, and now the CIA is talking about women's rights. Um, I, I think the, 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 when we talk about indigenization, building local um, society, empowering people uh, rather than imposing uh, issues on them, and, and, I, I, and I, having uh, been in Amnesty for the last eight years, eight and a half years, I think I'm well qualified to talk about that because this was an organization that adopted prisoners adopted and released prisoners. But when you talk about prisoners of poverty, you don't adopt them and you can't release them. You, they, through their own empowerment process, uh, get free themselves from poverty. You can only support them. So it's the same with women. You, can, you, know, you, have, you cannot actually emancipate women. Emancipation is a process, it's an internal process, whether it's for black uh, Africans or whether it's for women. Emancipation is, is a strengthening process from inside that has to happen. Now, there seems to be a sense that when we talk about women's rights, then we mean that all women are going to be like you and me, you know, dressed like this sitting here. No, <laughs> women want to live their lives uh, in different ways. And what you do is you create choices for women in Afghanistan. You, you let the Afghan women themselves figure out what they want. So again, that's a long-term process of changing. And there are some things where they may be very similar to women elsewhere in the world. There are some cultural things that they will want to hold on to. And moving slightly from your subject, that's why I think that it is so damaging to uh, ban the hijab or ban the headscarf and so on. I think women have to make those decisions themselves. And what governments have to do is to create an environment where women can make those choices and make those choices free of coercion, either to keep the scarf on or to take it off. But don't go telling women what to do. And that's the risk here, that the West, through its aid program, will start developing women's programs in Afghanistan that tend to be like women's programs elsewhere. But you have to engage with women there. Women there don't want to die in childbirth. Women there want to go to school. I mean, I, I worked with Afghan refugees in the camps in Pakistan in, in the 80s when I was with the UN at that time. And I remember at that time as a junior uh, UN official going into the camps, serving all these women, finding out what they, they wanted to go to school. And you know, there's one, one incident that I will never forget, and that was the story that one of the camp officers told me that in that particular camp there were no school uh, for, for um, um, girls, and uh, there was a little girl who wanted to go to school with her brothers. So uh, after a lot of hassling, etc., we managed to set up a girls' school. And I went to visit that school, and I found this little girl sitting there with her back to the rest of the class. So I said to the teacher, but this little girl wanted to come to school. Why is she sitting with her back to the rest of the class? That's because this girl said, I don't want to go to a girls' school. I want to go to a mixed school of girls and boys. And sh this little eight-year-old, was protesting with her back turned to the rest of the class. Now, that eight-year-old girl had that much of spine in her to be able to do that. So let's not be condescending about the women of Afghanistan. Let's talk to the women. Let's find out what they want. Let's engage. Let's build women's groups there. Help them. And they will figure out their own relationship with the Taliban and with their religious groups. Don't assume that they will necessarily be as anti-Taliban as, as uh, Western donors might want them to be. Some of them won't. Uh, so I think we need to develop a much greater understanding. And this is where the human rights project itself uh, becomes a very interesting one, because there isn't only one interpretation of rights. Uh, in, in its implementation, in its interpretation, uh, the rights will be interpreted in different ways. The basic values will remain the same, the principles. Fair trial is fair trial, but it happens in a different way in Belgium than in England. And the same thing will happen with women's rights as well. But you've got to engage with local people. You've got to have their voices heard. And that's the whole area of participation, the whole area of building, the, giving, creating that space. At the moment, there is no space. The only space in Afghanistan is a space for security. It's not for society. And that's, that's the big risk, and that's where the Taliban are moving in. We've seen that with Hamas and Gaza as well, that when, when, when you don't create the space for society, when you don't create the opportunities for, for people to build themselves, 
then they f- go to those who are offering them that, uh, that, but in a very different way. I think that as far as intentional using of power, projecting its power in order to obtain what one wants, that the Europeans have something to learn, to be quite honest. I think that we are very often very naive. Uh, the whole idea of, uh, for example, saying let's lead by example, uh, to be quite honest, I think that is naive. Uh, in a lot of cases, if you want a case to be heard, you need to put it forward in a, in a forceful way. And uh, the, the capacity for uh, Europeans to project their power, I, I mentioned that we pr- create a quarter of the wealth and we uh, produce about half of the, the corporation see, and I see right. and I see that we are we have not the half of the of the influence on the issues that are related to this question so if you ask uh, are we instrumentalizing our policies I don't think we, we do that a lot and uh, I, I really think that we do it less than others on the other hand where I want to accept the criticism of being eurocentric I think that very often in our language, in the way that we look upon the world, we have a view which is not uh, uh, universal enough. So you can criticize the Europeans for having uh, a, a somewhat biased understanding of how the world works and having a very uh, culturally biased uh, view on things. But as far as using the influence is concerned, to be quite honest, and I don't know if this is a popular answer, I think we don't do it enough.